Please be seated and get ready to be inspired, uplifted, and just taken to a new place in consciousness by our very own Energizer Bunny, <laughs> Reverend Sonia Davidson. Please help me welcome her. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carol. I, I am so grateful to you for being this morning, not only the host, but the cantor and the musical item. This is in addition to all the wonderful things that she does for this church. So welcome everyone who is in the sanctuary and those who are on the world wide web. Welcome to our beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. As usual, this time of the year is so wonderfully cool and yet bright. And we are so happy to have you all. Well, my topic this morning, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Belief. It's easy for us to believe when we have been convinced by a persuasive argument or when our senses have been presented with the evidence. However, what if, like everyone else, we are seeking after, desiring, longing for, dreaming of an experience beyond anything we are currently experiencing? What if everything that is going on around us denies the possibility of some of the things that we wish to attain. The world is continuing to go through special times. Things are taking place which people even older than I am are saying, no sir, I never seen anything like this before. Yet, be assured that the universe is unfolding as it should. I think that is from Desiderato. We need not trouble, be troubled, but rather shore up our belief in the ever-present reality of, as the psalmist says, that which neither slumbers nor sleeps. To be certain, there is an underlying orderliness to all that appears that reveals itself in its own way. Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of religious science and exponent of the science of mind philosophy, says it this way, while the laws of mind, like all, the law, all laws, are neutral, good must finally overcome the appearance of evil. Evil is a negation. Good is positive, like light and darkness. Darkness cannot overcome light, but light can neutralize darkness. That is why Jesus, he said, said to us, seek ye first the kingdom and everything else will be added. And what is the doorway to that kingdom? Belief. Jesus also said many times, many, many times, he has used the word belief. In fact, I am reliably told that he used the word 257 times. Let us consider a story of no other than the master himself, Jesus the Christ. It's taken from the King James, no, it's the modified version, the modern version of the Bible. This version is from Mark, but it's also in Matthew. 
The story is in two parts. In the first part of this story, that is known as a transfiguration, Jesus went up into a high mountain, taking with him Peter, James, and John, three of his disciples, while the other disciples waited for him in the village. They were about, that is Peter, James, and John, and yes, Jesus, were about to have a life-altering experience. While there, the three disciples, they went up into a high mountain, remember. And while they were there, they witnessed an amazing phenomenon where Jesus' form changed to a luminous, dazzling apparition. I don't hear that transfiguration being spoken about too often, perhaps because up until now, it was difficult to explain in scientific terms what was really happening. So it may have been seen more as metaphorical. But now, with the advance in quantum physics, we can understand. I won't give you a lecture in quantum physics this morning, but I can tell you that it is quite easy to understand what took place. Jesus became so dazzling, his form became so dazzling that it was even difficult for the disciples to look at him. But while he was there, he met with the form of Elijah and Moses. I don't think quantum physics has really gotten there yet. But they noticed him having a conversation with Jesus. Of course, they were both terrified and elated at the same time. And they started to babble about making, you know, a house for Jesus and Moses and Elijah. But that was not to be. And a cloud appeared and seemed to completely cover the form of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And a voice, a booming voice, was said to have come from apparently no particular place or everywhere, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And as quickly as the apparitions came, they were gone, and there was no one else beside Jesus. So, as strange as I said, this experience was, it seemed to have pivoted Jesus into his healing ministry. And these disciples who were chosen metaphorically represent Peter, strong, enduring, unwavering faith. And it probably took some faith to have witnessed that phenomenon. James, the faculty of judgment, the quality that weighs a question and draws a conclusion. I assume that James would have come to some, would have thought about it and come to some very practical explanation of what he had seen. And John, the faculty of love, that which realized that Jesus in this exalted state was the epitome of love, the presence of God made manifest as we all are but they saw it in a very vivid, present way. There was no mistake that Jesus chose those three disciples who presented as faith, judgment, and love. And so they were privileged to witness that point in Jesus' ministry where he was about to really take off big, in his healing ministry. He was now vibrating at an even higher frequency than before. So when they came down out of the mountain, that is the next part of the story, a big crowd was seen, and a crowd seeing Jesus just ran towards him. 
That was the magnetic attraction of the man at the time. Ran towards him and Jesus saw his disciples standing, having an argument with some learned people, called them teachers of the law. They surrounded them and were talking with him. And Jesus asked the disciples, what's happening? What are you arguing about? And the crowd explained that there was a healing that needed to be take place. Jesus then listened carefully as he heard that the disciples had attempted to do healing and had failed to do so. They told him so themselves. But the crowd also verified that. So they brought to him a man whose son was very ill. Then again, when it was described vividly as as a boy who was occupied by a demonic spirit. But in our modern day understanding in medicine, we know that that was a very, very typical description of an epileptic seizure, right? There is no doubt. If you read it for yourself, we'll all know that. So the man said, Jesus, please help me. Please help me. And Jesus said, I can help you if you believe. And what did the man say? I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And Jesus did just that. The boy, when he was brought to Jesus, went into a major fit and collapsed and was as if dead. And Jesus very calmly took his hand and said, he chastised that which was in him and demanded that it be driven out. And when the disciples asked Jesus, so how come we couldn't do it and you did it? He said, this kind comes only from prayer. They were not praying. They were arguing. How many times we meet a situation in our lives where, you know, there's some doubt or something that seems big, really big, because let's face it, this was a dramatic experience which could really, really obscure the vision of the disciples that they were, that they were caught up with the phenomena, with the outer experience. And, and instead, instead of looking beneath and being prayerful and being still, they were arguing about what, obviously, what to do and what was going on and what was the nature. So basically, the message to us for Jesus is be prayed up. Coming up into the mountain, uh, Jesus showed us uh, an example of what to do. We are to live from that mountaintop of consciousness. How to get there? We need to spend time in prayer and we need to spend time in the silence. So that when we meet the situations that could appear to frighten us, to disturb us, then what do we need to do? Instead of being afraid and saying, oh, I believe, but deep down there is doubt. You say to yourself, help thou my unbelief. You admit that there is something in you which needs to continue to pray, to see the truth about what you are about to change. And so we give up. Yes, we give up sometimes because when we have prayed, the unbelief sometimes takes over. And then we are in that mode that we are thinking how come things are not happening and we are projecting into the future. And Eckhart Tolle says, give up 
waiting as a state of mind. No, be present. When you catch yourself slipping into waiting, come into the present moment. Just be there and enjoy being. Unbelief may sneak into your mind that is firmly, in the mind that is firmly rooted in the acceptance of good. We need to be vigilant at all times. We want to be sure that we are not afraid. And therefore, if we find ourselves looking into the future and asking ourselves, why is this not happening? That is unbelief. We need to enjoy being in the present. We need to be in that consciousness which lets go of the desire to make things happen quickly. No, I need to convince, to confess that I have an experience which caused me to call out for the help of a practitioner. I have, I live in a house which is maybe as old as I am, but it has good bones. You know, when I say a house has good bones, and I know, like a lot of things in it, because I thought that, well, the things that are in the house were made of good wood, good this, good everything. So, yes, I needed to have a new kitchen, but I kept insisting that I did not want the things to be torn out but just to be, you know, fixed. Now, my husband had a different idea. He said, tear out the whole this thing, man. Tear it out. But I said, this is good wood. Maybe they don't have this good wood anymore, you know? Just put on a counter, put in some doors and so on. You see what is happening? You're holding on to what exists before. There's a little fear that what you are you're not ready for the new thing because it may not be as good as the old, right? Unbelief, unbelief. So what happened? Yes, we agreed that we would deal with the kitchen. Now that was just when COVID started first, I think it was March or April. So he got a carpenter to come and the camp said, no man, you have to tear out everything, tear out everything agreed with him and because his, his mind was definite and certain. So yes, of course, when you're definite and certain, the universe will agree with you. So they tore out everything. And believe me, for another three months, there was no kitchen. It was there. And every time I looked inside at the kitchen, all I could see was what was not there. And so it was really becoming, I was, I was becoming self-indulgent. Instead of looking at how I knew it could be and would be, I was seeing the big empty space. So anyway, eventually, a carpenter came and put down the cupboards with, a, with open space, not the cupboards, just the countertop. So then there were another um, months to wait. And he just didn't appear. He didn't appear. So we met up on another person who said, he just happened, serendipity, right? The law. He, he said, I am a great carpenter. I, I, I am the one who could finish this and make it you know, wonderful. So my husband jumped at that idea and immediately gave him a large deposit to go to buy the woods, right? Shortly after we had done that, we are hearing from other people, right? I am hearing from other people. No, you don't give those people money just to go away, you know, with. They may not come back with it. So I said, no, man, I affirm. No, 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 I'm, I'm seeing. No, I'm into that mood where I'm seeing my kitchen. So I'm really working at it. One month pass, no man. Two months pass, no man. Three months pass, no man. I said, no, 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 my husband, you have to do something about this. Tried to call the man with the name he gave. No phone number, no man. 
right? You see, you're in the back of your mind, unbelief is at work. It is at work. So what happened? Long story, but I have to tell you because it's a learning. One night, about 9.30, knock, knock on the door. There comes the man saying, I come to fix, finish this thing, right? I was sick. I was knocked down and I had to spend the money. And, it, you know, I had to spend the money, but I'm coming. So he goes away in another month. We don't see him again. Then he comes back to see I had to work the money. No, the long and the short of the story, or the long of it, right, is that he came back eventually and said, I'm going to give you your kitchen for the Christmas. And I'm going to make it the most beautiful kitchen that I have ever done. I really want so you can, when I finish, you can come to, I'm going to come to you and fix me up, Doc. I'm going to feel, you're going to fix me up. I say, I'll fix you up even without that. Give me my kitchen. It turned out that this man and his people are the ones who make the kitchens for all these ready-made kitchens that you see around the place. And I can promise you, after I decided to let go and in prayer power, I asked Steve Golden, just spontaneously, because we don't really ask for prayer in prayer, but we, we do it spontaneously. I said, Steve, you need to pray me up so I stop looking at what isn't there. I want, I want my kitchen. And he gave such a beautiful prayer, including how I'm going to feel when I walk into it. And he didn't leave out any feelings. And exactly what I have. A beautiful beauty. One of these days, you'll all be invited to, right? <laughs> when COVID stop keeping, right? A beautiful kitchen. The moral of the story is that unbelief takes all kind of subtle forms. And it, it, practitioner or no practitioner, or no matter how much you know and how much you say you believe, unbelief is when you do not allow yourself to look past the appearance and look deep into what lies beneath. What lies beneath always is the presence of God. And the presence of God appears to us as we recognize it in the form and feeling and experience that is appropriate for us in the moment at the time. So I have decided to continue to stay in that place where I'm happy, peaceful, and joyful all the time. And I needed that wake up call with the kitchen as something as mundane as the kitchen to remind me that I believe What? Help thou my unbelief. So I have an affirmation which I am committed to using, and there are others. I believe in complete unity with good. I have complete confidence in my knowledge and understanding of God. And you can share it with me. I believe in complete unity with good. I believe in complete unity with good. I have complete confidence in my knowledge and understanding of good. I have complete knowledge and understanding of good. So if at any time you feel that you want to go after anything, and that's why we are here, to experience good, experience life more abundant. And we, there's a little chance that there may be unbelief. Here's an affirmation. That which I seek is seeking me. That which belongs to me comes to me. That which I seek is seeking me. That which belongs to me comes to me. I now accept all that I have hoped for and believed in. I now accept all that I have hoped for and believed in. And I like it better when they say all that I expect. So I now accept all all that I expect and believe in. So we have to admit 
that we are living in a time which calls for focus. It calls for belief. And sometimes we may be distracted, and I warn you, if you get caught up in the media, you might have to call out more than once. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. <laughs> it is clear to me that the universe has been finding over the last 12 months all kinds of dramatic ways to reestablish divine order in the collective experience of mankind, of which we are each an integral part. It is so important then that we train our minds to think on these things that St. Paul exhorts us to do in Philippians 4, verse 8. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, and praiseworthy. Think on these things. Remember our song, you can take it home with you. Friends, I do, and I'm sure you do too, want to live in a world where people do find the joy they seek, know how to find peace which passeth all understanding. Because God is life, God is everywhere, in all and through all. Then peace is likewise there. So is love. So is beauty. So is order. So is light. So is wisdom, yes. In the midst of every situation, we can find joy if we believe. And here's another affirmation. Yeah, I'm into that mood this morning. There is nothing in me that can doubt that good will make its appearance in my experience. There is nothing in me that can doubt that good will make its appearance in my experience. I see in everyone that which I know to be true of myself. I see in everyone that which I know to be true of myself. Because that's how we have to live. When we are living from that point of view where everyone becomes our brother, then we begin to have a worldview that is wider than just us and our immediate environment. You will find yourself thinking across the entire world, the physical earth, but also the family of the human race. And so, my friends, you can say when you're in that consciousness, you know that you're well on the way to living free of doubt or with just glimpses of doubt and you will not indulge in doubt or unbelief. And so you can say with confidence, I am guided by infinite intelligence into that light which is eternal. My soul is jubilant. So I wanted to say my last affirmation, I am guided by infinite wisdom. Infinite wisdom into that light which is eternal. And my last one that I love, my soul is jubilant. Say it out, say it loud. My soul is jubilant. And so it is. <laughs>